Yeah, man. Cold keepers. KTC, that mean keep the cold. KTC, that mean keep the cold, man. Who's who's out here vibing and driving up, man? Hey, Aqua Ty got us popping off, man. I, I'm over here just digging on some of that copper thread drop, man. You know what I'm saying? Falling back in it with y'all. Brazil, also known as High Brazil. Okay. Over several other variants of Phantom Island. Said to lie in the Atlantic Ocean west of Ireland. A little High Brazil, huh? All right, so we got a little... uh spec over here <laughs> that we're calling high brazil or phantom island okay okay now uh didn't we uh talk about that regamon with that sylvanus to texas drop <laughs> wasn't there a, an irish situation with this tuatha they do do nan let's go Irish myth. Now, ain't the Irish swarthy, right? So this is all about you, my love. You described it as cloaked in mist, except for one day every seven years when it becomes visible, but it can still, it still cannot be reached. The etymology of the names High Brazil or Brazil and High Brazil is unknown, but in Irish tradition, it is thought to come from the Irish or Brazil meaning descendants, clan, man. And we've been digging on X marks the spot. The towel, you know, clan Ross, my nugget. <laughs> on your front door, they talking Irish, we talking Scottish, same thing, origin. Origin, right? Even though we know we are the uh, India superior originals, but we are still the origin of all these particular areas, you know what I'm saying, as far as the, uh, you know, the pop offness, you know what I'm saying, the regal, the royal, you know what I mean, it's always going to come back to the house, my nugget. Hell, we were talking about a house, right? The clans, right? Despite the similarity, the name of the country Brazil, also spelled Brazil, has no connection to the mythical island. Not that they, you know, can say the South American country was first named Veracruz, Island of the True Cross. We've been talking about the town, Tara de Santa Cruz, or... <laughs> Or Tara Santa. Tara de Santa is Santa. Santa is Santa Cruz. Cross, cross. We got to look at uh, Oak Island too, man. I got You know what I'm saying? I mean, we was digging on that Agartha. We're going to get some more of that Agartha drive. But you know, she had this flow going on in the copper thread, but not. So, okay, okay. Called the land of the Holy Cross by the Portuguese navigators who arrived there, but after some decades, it was started to be called Brazil in Portuguese due to the exploration or exploitation of native Brazil wood. At that time, the only export of the land in Portuguese Brazil wood is called Pau Brazil. The word Brazil commonly given the etymology red like the ember <laughs> can't make this stuff up you know don't you got a natural by law shout out to the bro make sure you're in his classroom templar what it do and we just talking about embers and ambers man the ember and the amber let me go get that drop you know natural by law templar you know popping all man we're just talking about high brazil man mythical islands right Oh, 
a list of mythological places. Okay. <laughs> top of the one, you, top of the list, you see Agartha. So we're going to dig on some more of this Agartha drop. Legendary kingdom said to be located at the Earth's core, related to the belief in hollow Earth. Well, you don't have to believe in some ball to believe that there's layers to the Earth plane. Can you dig? Huh? Okay, okay, okay. 19th century occultist Alexander Saint Yevez <laughs> Alexander <laughs> published a reliable account on Agartha in Europe. According to him, the secret world of Agartha and all its wisdom and wealth will be accessible for all mankind when Christianity lives up to the what? Commandments? Uh oh. Uh oh, boss. I don't think they mean Christianity like you're saying. <laughs> they might be talking about Nestorians again, right? Okay. Okay. So you got to keep the code to get access to the wisdom. In which then wisdom is now being a conqueror. Right? What's the motto? Vitrix Fortuna Sapientia. Wisdom is the conqueror of fortune. But in order to get mama, you got to keep the code, right? <laughs> All right, let's go. So once you got the commandments, which were once drafted by Moshe and Hawa, you get that what? Access. When the anarchy which existed in our world is replaced by sin carne. Hmm. Generally means joint rule or harmonious rule. Okay, okay, okay. So we're living in harmony. We're living in harmony in Agartha. Now look down here. Agar Agartha is frequently associated with Shambhala. They say confused well. Now we're just talking Shambhala again. Sibola, 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 man. Cities of go. Oh, oh. We're talking cities of go, man. All right. We're talking Preston Khan, Priest Khan, Grand Khan, yeah, man. Hey, they don't want to give it away that you're in India Superior. All right. So Gartha may very well be the same spot as Shambhala. Let's look at a few more on this list. <laughs> okay, I'm going quick. All right, you got High Brazil. Okay, Camelot, King Arthur Spot. El Dorado, City of Gold, Feather Mountain, Elysian Garden of Eden. Okay. Ah, my jigger said uh, <laughs> they got Hawaii. So with this Hawaii, ancestral land of the Polynesians. Particularly the more Maori. The Maori. Now I got a feeling these Maori might actually connect more to Mu to the ancient love song than to anyone calling themselves more today. You know, it might have something to do with that dragon spiral, not so much the Atlantean snake. You know what I'm saying? You know, that's the hijack. Sometimes they're hiding in our own tents, man. They call this Hawaii. So you heard of Hawaii. This is Hawaii. All right. Then you got a, a Hawaku, Hawaku. You see Hawaii all over the places, all over these names, right? Polynesian mythology, Hawaii. Cook Islands, Moray. Samoan is also Salomon. Uh oh, uh oh. Uh-oh, Tahiti, Tahata, <laughs> Havi, Hawa, original home of the Polynesians before dispersed across Polynesia. It also features an under underworld, underworld in many more stories. So we're talking about Agartha, underworld cities. I was gonna let this video flow, you know, I'm just checking in with my nagas. I feel really great, man, because my nagas is hitting the mark, you know what I'm saying?
You got X marking that spot. And remember, man, that spot is different, you know, depending on what you observe, right? The hijack, they could put an X up and right there in the middle, that intersection, you know, just like the uh, double slit experiment with quantum, you know, physics, quantum mechanics, you know what I'm saying? This is their deepest subject matter of when a particle's being observed, my nugget, <laughs> it then chooses one possibility, all right? So when you observe something, when we choose to observe something together, united, we now are choosing to want the same thing. What are we gonna observe? We keep the code. We start wanting the same thing. We want to keep a direct line with our creator, our Hawa. We want a direct flow, right? No power before power, right? We don't take Hawa's name in vain, which means that we don't take our breath of security in vain, right? <laughs> right? So what happens when you take your own breath of sec and security in vain? You know what I'm saying? You have no life. We keep our Shabbat. We rest to charge up with our Hawa to get our weapon, to get our food. These are things that we witness now because we observe the code. And by doing that, we collapse the wave pattern on one possibility. And that's where X marks the spot, my nigga. And that's why we vibing up. And this is why we tribing up. Ka. But observing through your invaders eyes, they got you collapsing the wave pattern on a different spot. By the time you get the Confederate flag, that's why people so charged up, hatred on the Confederate flag, because that X, that that spot is all bad, right? That's that's uh slavery, you know what I'm saying? That's that's torment, you know what I'm saying, and torture. That's invasion. Their spot ain't your spot, their peace ain't your peace, their towel ain't your towel. By the time they put the Christian cross on it, they that that cross, that spot, ain't your wisdom, Managa, but ours is Ama, Ama. Wisdom is the conqueror of fortune. What fortune? You want your inheritance, you want your land, you want your soul, Managa. <laughs> you want you, you want a future, man. You want that fountain, you want that water, that mem sauce, man. So when they talk Irish, we're just connecting it to Scotland. Hawaki, under underworld, huh? Okay, let's go. Says the explorer James Cook first sighted New Zealand, 1769. He had Tapaui on board, and Ratian, the neighbor, navigator, and linguist. Cook's arrival seemed to be a confirmation of a prophecy. Man, we got prophecies. <laughs> All right, a priest from Mahia. A Togan at Togan Bay, Tapoi, Tapoi conversed with his guest, Tahunga, associated with the school of learning located there, called Te Ra Hero. The priest asked about the Moray homelands, Ra Giatia, Hawaki, the ancient name for Ratia, and Tahiti, or Tahiti, body bag for the illusion. So with High Brazil, we had that connection with the true cross, right? Another uh, word or meaning for Tao is true. It means truth. So a true cross is a truth. It's the truth. It's the commandment. It's the code. You know what I'm saying? It's the Tao. What is the truth, my nigga? <laughs> the truth is that Hawaii exists. You know what I'm saying? Tau Hiti is also Tau Hata, but you see they put the Tau on it. Back to the Tau. Back to the Tau. So this is what's being represented on your shield. By the time they put their own Tau, their own sign, their own monument, their own cross, they put their own covenant, right? They, they made you collapse the wave pattern in hell. Hawa says to observe the code to collapse the wave pattern in paradise, man, forever and ever, right? Let's go. David is calm forever. Back to the town. Back to the roost. Lego. Hey, we're just talking Hawaki and Tau Hiti. 
That's cool, man. We'll you know talk on these Mori some more. Since the Mori word, how we key figures and legends about the arrival of Mori and Antori, Antiero, New Zealand. Okay, the name appearing variously as Haviki, Haviaka, Aviaki, Hawa, Hawaki, or the misspelling Hawaiiki <laughs> uh, appear to have become the most common variants used in English. Man, some good drop here. Gotta dig on these more, eh? Gotta dig on these more, eh? Also known as the Tyrell, or their language. More, also known as Tyrell, or Tao, all right? <laughs> Eastern Polynesian language, right? So we got to get back on that King Kamahama or King Kamahawa. You know what I'm talking about. King Hamehameha. You know what I mean? Come on, come on. Yeah, come on, come on. <laughs> um, you know, that United the Islands and all that. You know, how does this play with this more? How does this play with Moo? The indigenous population of New Zealand, you know, they got all their, you know, saying connection with their, you know, spiritual flow, right? So Moray, Tua, Motun. Tahitian, Tahitian gained recognition as one of New Zealand's official languages, 1987. Since the Maori language did not have a writing system, skip down. The language did not have a writing system, so they must have been on some high frequency. You only start writing, you know what I'm saying, when you start really falling in consciousness, man. Like, you don't really need it at all when you're you know, really popping off, you know what I'm saying? Since missionaries arrived from 1814, learned to speak more and introduced the Latin alphabet, 18C. <laughs> now they got to write stuff down, right? 1817, Tiatori and his junior relative Tui sailed to England. They visited Professor Samuel Lee in Cambridge and assisted him in the preparation of a grammar and vocabulary of Moray. So they invented a written language for these people. I didn't need a written language, but to them, they were civilizing, right? <laughs> man, shout out to the more man. man. And uh, even right above the house. Or you got to out the wow. uh, yeah. up with the Sylvanus to Texas recon, right? Daniel Lowe recon, 775 AD. Right, the legend of Ogier of the Dane, son of Godfrey Cadrode and Dune de Mayens, actually referred to Tuwate de Danan or Dunan, who also are known as the Mananan or Maine of America, where the giant ogre heads of the almond are found. They just they just compared the Tuwate de Danan and the almond, my nagi. The almond, which is back to the who? The she. The she, called themselves the she, right? The almond called themselves the she. Again, you got the tau, you got the X, right? Khan, the she. Yeah. To what the day that man. Tawatha de Danan or Dunan, also known as the Maine and Nan or Maine of America, where the giant ogre heads of the almond are found. Ogre, almond, ogre, almond. They make you look like ogres in these cartoons, but they're just referring to the almond. Khan. 
the she, right? The she Tawatha Day Day Nan. All right, they got four magical treasures from four legendary cities, man. One of these cities is Phineas. Tawatha Day Day Nan, Almec. So you got to connect the Almec with these four magical treasures, man. Phineas, dig on Phineas, man. <laughs> oh, man. Phineas, uh, sword of light, sword of light. No one ever escaped from it once was drawn from its sheath and no one could resist it. The sword is also described in the Tang legend as Nuadu's Kani, a glowing bright torch, man. Any dragon drop, man, with these flaming swords? Flaming swords, man. You know, we got to dig on this, man. The four treasures of Tuatha. I think that might be a good drop, man. <laughs> what y'all think, man? What y'all think? Hey, man, I'm just enjoying popping off with you, my noggins. We did it again, man. My noggins, we are continuing to flow. I just want to give a shout out to some of the recent contributors, you know, that's continuing to rise us above, you know, so we can, uh, you know, double up and keep helping and keep doing what we got to do to our family in need and to Texas making those repairs. Again, man, we're just so grateful, you know, for the bro Yosef for real, just the opportunity um, to, you know, be a wall of protection, to show us that we're a wall of protection. You know, it's, it's worth it, you know what I'm saying, to show the tribe what they can do, you know what I'm saying? We appreciate you for allowing us to, you know what I'm saying, be a wall of protection. And Yosef, Yosef is our very first dragon sponsor at 432 to drop radio so that's how far we go back if anyone deserves man you to rally and, and show him what the foundation is it's yourself the real man so uh you know what i'm saying he got his situation fixed good you know what i'm saying and you know um he even got it you know a little more on the low you know what i'm saying we thought it was going to be wow that you know up to the four thousand some five thousand range he got it around the two two uh, two and a half you know so it left us with a little pot, you know what I'm saying? We were able to drop a bag on my aqua, Miss D, fire ball. You know, she needs it. She knows she deserves it. And, you know, still have a little leftover to build up for the next family as they come in need. So we appreciate you, my noggins. It feels so good to drop a bag on, you know what I'm saying, our tribe, you know what I'm saying, to let them know that you care. This is here because you care. You did this, man. You did this. You did this job, next. Tracy Slocum, Robert Scott, Roosevelt Parks, Juan Rodriguez. You did this. You did this, my name is Stephen Torres, Jerkery Strickland, Deshaun Percy, Sandra De Sanders Delaney, Marco Walker, all my anonymous family, hey, hi, come on, Lee, Abiyab, Jamal Victor. You did this, my name. you know what I mean? Hey, shout to Robert Scott. He said, all praise to our creator. Much love and respect to the family. Always needing that drop drop. Keep that water flowing. Good bravo. Malaki. <laughs> hey, uh, my bread, Robert Scott, man. And we appreciate all y'all, man. Stephen Torres said, Exodus 20 got us in code. M-H-O-E. Hey, we don't got to fear when we got 500 code. Keeping Nagas right here. So Managa, you keep dropping it and we'll keep spreading the AI to our family in Texas. And, uh, you know, this is going to get us just in this, in that Ruach of, uh, of just remaining unified, you know what I'm saying? And make sure we got that $10, $20, $50, $100 for whatever the tribe needs it. Pretty soon we're going to drop a new GoFundMe so we can just, you know, put it on land funds, man, because we need to tribe up and just start buying up small spots of land all over the place. So, I'm going to put a fund together just to build up for that. You know what I'm saying? So we can say, okay, we hit our goal. We got 2.5 acres in Arizona. We got 1.3 acres in Colorado. All right, let's go. <laughs> and pretty soon we're going to have, 
12, 15, 20 spots, you know what I'm saying, and then develop our spots, my naga, you see the vision. You see the vision, man. Look out for his drive nation. All praise are created. M-H-O-C, because around here, my naga, is K-T-C. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> around here, my naga, it is K-T-C, man. What y'all know about K-T-C, that mean keep the cold. Uh, K-T-C, that mean keep the cold. Uh, K-T-C, that mean keep the cold. Hello, wow. We got five. We got 500 cold keepers, man. We got 500 cold keeping noggins, man. KTC, that me keep the cold. Yeah, we did it again. Tribal Mafia. To your feet, we be dripping gold. KTC, that means keep the cold. Keep the cold. KFC, we do that no more. No more. Cherokee, like the days of old. Days of old. Vaccinate, we just tell them no. Tell them no. We the copper car original. original. Press the job, we've been here before. Jose at three, we already know. Uh. Grand Canyon, they be hiding acres. Uh. Killing purple at like my favorite Laker. Laker. KTC, that mean keep the code. Keep the code. Rest in peace, Kobe, here to go. Mama with the wings, that's a dragon. That's a dragon. Used to bell up with my pants sagging. Now we redefine high fashion. high fashion. Got that glow for whoever's asking. Uh, Chicken mago on your favorite corner. Need that work for your favorite donor. Mint sauce to your front door. Make them holler, we don't want no more. Uh, Driving up is our only option. For the car, we go get it poppin'. KTC, that mean keep the cold. Cold keep us here from head to toe. Uh, last chance is you friend or foe. Cause we hijack free, we'll sink your bones. Scooney comments rapping how we cool. That's the Bonico shook these noggin shoes. KTC, you know how we do. But our power first will never lose. Purple tears of joy, I love you. Purple crying cuz red us blue. And put it on the AI. MHO E taking off. Yeah, we dripping in that man's song. We paid the cost, now we beat the ball. Travel music, we just let them know. KTC, that means keep the call. Tribal Mafia, they going stupid. Getting smarter because the drop is fluid. Fire started just to light it up. The coups they died trying to trap them up. Slip that treaty through the back door. Peace and friendship made it more and more. Grab my shield, wouldn't hesitate. While they argue heritage or hate. USA call it Hijack City. PSA, you ain't fucking with me. OG Naga from the days of old. KTC, that mean keep the cold. Swan Knight, I'm a bravo. That was back in 774. We're bitten histories, we got the book. MHO, E, we got the book. Bye bye, smile, drinking hot water. Now we can all say a lot of KTC, that mean keep the call. Keep the call. Enjoy Shabbat, chillin' in my row. In my row. That's Clam Ross at your front door. Mm. You gonna pay your way and ask that go. Montezuma uh, for the free throw. free throw. Nipsey hustle, let the wings grow. Wings grow. He gon' hit us with that free flow. Free flow. He can crunch all in that green low. Green low. Hit the switches for the free show. Free show. Carpet chickens in the street, bro. Both for two, we the free show. KTC, that me keep the cold. KTC, that me keep the cold. KTC, keep the cold. KTC, keep the cold. KTC, keep the cold. Yeah. Wow.
We got five on a code. Keep it noggins. KTC. Keep the code. That's what we do. It's this tribe of music, man. A beautiful genre of music, man. <laughs> Inspired by Five Eyes Ma, you know what I'm saying? And we're going to keep it going, you know what I'm saying? Because this is uh, more fulfilling than anything else. You know, we've done it in a long time. It's making music, you know, for the tribe and, you know, just enjoying the flow. Hey, shout out to the producers, man. Tribe producers, man. All the producers putting out their beats. You know, allowing us just to dig on it, man, put some lyrics to it and, and just learn, man, and grow and just vibe up. You know what I'm saying? The music's always been real important, man, in our in our tribe up and our our flow, you know what I'm saying, on whatever path we on. You know, we at war, music music is important, that beat is important, you know what I'm saying? We we in love, music is important. So, you know, we love our creators, so music is important, man. Tribal muff. Hey, KTC, keep the code. 500, 500, 500 code. Keep it nice, keep it flowing. From a toe, Texas, it's all honorable. You know what I mean? It's, it's an honor to do this with my noggins, you know what I'm saying? To be in this flow with you in real time is it, it's, it's the most amazing feeling. You know what I'm saying? So, the wada to you, my noggins. The water drop nation, you know what I mean? There's no better experience than it is to, you know, rock with my tribe, man, in real time. So the vibe is real. The tribe is real, man. Drop nation, man. We coon. Let's go deep, man. Let's uh finish this video out on the cigar the drop, man. See how deep we can go in the flow, man. Hey, shout out wild to the cold keeper. We're going to pick it up right here, man. You know what I'm saying? Right where we left off. Shout out. Mr. Mythos. <laughs> hey, hi, man. Fair use in your caboose bowl. Lego. Probably would have been forgotten as a wild rock of the imagination if it weren't for a Polish scientist, Fernando Osendowski, who, in 1922, published the book Beast, Men, and Gods, an account of his escape into Central Asia, fleeing from the Bolsheviks in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution. Dr. Osendowski stated that during his travels in... Man, I see, man. Soft in their tracks, silent and still, often crouching their attention fixated on the ground. He wrote, quote, Earth and sky ceased breathing. The wind did not blow and the sun did not move. Mm. All living beings in fear were involuntarily thrown into prayer and waiting for their fate. Eventually, he asked an old Mongol shepherd who he had become acquainted with what was happening in these moments. Thus, it has always been the shepherd explained, <laughs> whenever the king of the world in his underground palace prays and searches out the destiny of all peoples on the earth. Though the shepherd did not give a name for this place, he stated that there live the invisible rulers of all pious people, the king of the world, or Brahitma, who can speak with God as I speak with you, and his two assistants, Mahitma, knowing the purposes of future events, and Mahinga, ruling the causes of those events. He knows all the forces in the world and reads all the souls of mankind and the great book of their destiny. This story stuck with Dr. Osendowski throughout his journey, and he would frequently stop to speak with Buddhist monks and lamas about traditions associated with caves caverns and tunnels in the region on multiple occasions a name for the place was given the kingdom of agarti which he himself dubbed the mystery of mysteries this underground source was said to channel miraculous power to tibetan monks and the dalai lama in particular powers that outsiders could scarcely begin to appreciate but still, there existed an even more powerful man than the Dalai Lama. 
this man being the king of the world, Inigarti. His enormous power was such that he could destroy whole areas of the planet at will if he chose to, and it could equally be harnessed, for instance, as a means of propulsion for vehicles of transport. Modern readers of Olsendowski point out that his 1922 recounting is a possible prediction of nuclear energy, such as the atomic bomb and nuclear-powered aircraft, a real technology today which is still considered too dangerous for civilian use. There are many obvious parallels in Dr. Olsendowski's account and that of Santiev, most notably the notion of a hidden subterranean kingdom named Agarti and his triple spiritual authority known as the Brahitma, Mahitma, and Mahinga. <laughs> so clearly, you know, you're talking Nagas, guy. You know, you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let go. Which are slightly altered spellings or pronunciations of Saint Yev's Agartha, Brahatma, Mahatma, and Mahanga. At first glance, we may be inclined to think that Osendowski simply plagiarized Santiev, who wrote Mission of India 36 years before Osendowski's account was published. This would be the obvious case, if not for a few factors. First, Dr. Osendowski kept a daily journal and even brought back many items from his travels through Mongolia, thus providing evidence that his journey actually occurred. Second, he was investigated by the French philosopher and Vedic scholar René Guénon, who wrote that, quote, He has affirmed to us that he had never read saint Yev, whose name was even unknown to him before the French translation of his book. And for our part, we have no reason to doubt his sincerity. Guénon, however, was not satisfied with his investigation and contacted his Eastern colleagues for more information which he eventually compiled two years later in his book, The King of the World, which examined the legend of Agartha specifically. Compellingly, Gainon stated that, independently of the evidence offered by Osandowski, we know through other sources that stories of this kind are widely current in Mongolia and throughout Central Asia, and we can add that there is something similar in the traditions of most peoples. And he again affirmed that Dr. Osandowski's charge of plagiarism is wholly unfounded. Over those two years of independent research, Gainon had been informed of a vast underground network of caverns and tunnels, some running for hundreds of miles, which were thought to eventually lead to a true center of world governance a place described very much like the legend of the island, surviving the ebb and flow of civilizations and catastrophes on Earth by remaining hidden deep underground, an impenetrable vault of all of history's knowledge and wisdom. Near the end of his book, Gainon debates the ontological question of whether Agartha is a true-to-life geographic location or perhaps simply a metaphorical concept. Driving the ebb and flow of civilizations and catastrophes on Earth are remaining hidden deep underground, an impenetrable vault of all of history's knowledge and wisdom. Near the end of his book, Gainon debates the ontological question of whether Agartha is a true-to-life geographic location had to get that map drop. I mean, I can't make this stuff up. We told you that they flipped your maps, right? Are they giving you a truer, truer perspective? And when the map is flipped, my Nagi, is America on the east or on the west? Are you the Far East? Are you the Orient now? Oh, the South is North? The South is North and the North is South. You want to go North Pole? You want to go North Pole? Or perhaps simply a metaphorical concept. Here, he brings up a point that is often associated with Vajrayana Buddhism, 
which is that their concepts have both an inner and outer meaning. The inner, of course, implies that of deep understanding and spiritual attainment. The outer, however, plain and simple, is a notion that it actually physically exists. Mm. And in this case, a powerful and ancient kingdom hidden under the surface of the earth. Uh oh. Even if we decide to discount the writings of Ganon, Osandowski, and Saint Yev, believe it or not, there are actually three independent sources for Agartha, proving that this concept and name was not an invention of 19th century Western occultists. The first definite independent source is the manuscripts of Prince Harji Sharif, written before he met Saint Yev making them the only concrete evidence that the term Agartha comes from an Eastern origin. The second independent source is a book written by the historian Louis Jacques Colliot in 1873, 12 years before saint Yev began his Sanskrit lessons, making this the earliest verifiable mention of the subterranean kingdom. Jacques Colliot a magistrate in Chandernagore, South India, for many years, had an insatiable thirst for collecting sacred texts and tales from the East and sharing them with the Western world. And in 1873, he wrote of a city of the sun known as Asgartha, which was ruled by successive Brahmatras, ancient Indian priest kings, until a conquest by an invading force threatened the land. <laughs> Come on, man. It's a more on more war. Look, we ain't over here picking on nobody. We're just saying everywhere we look, you pop up invading some holy place, man. Making treaties of pieces and friendships. You can't make this stuff up, man. So you got the priest kings, right? The Prestors are, are chilling. Here comes Genghis Khan in it, right? 1202 invasion, right? Here comes, you know what I'm saying, this, uh, you know, backdoor deal in the midst of the Chickamauga War. More or more. <laughs> Man. The second independent source is a book written by the historian Louis Jacques Colliot in 1873. 12 years before saint Yev began. What's up with that blue, though? Was that that blue Marvel drop, man? <laughs> Love to Five Eyes Mod, man. Love to Naturally Go. His Sanskrit lessons, making this the earliest verifiable mention of the subterranean kingdom. Jacques Colliot, a magistrate in Chandernagore, South India, for many years, had an insatiable thirst for collecting sacred texts and tales from the East and sharing them with the Western world. And in 1873, he wrote of a city of the sun known as Asgartha. Cities of God. Which was ruled by successive Brahmatras, ancient Indian priest kings. And Prestors, and they get wrote up on by until a conquest by an invading force threatened the land 10,000 years ago. Bang. Two years later, in 1875, he expanded on his account of Askartha for the first time implying that it was hidden underground. This unknown world, of which no human power, even now when the land above has been crushed under the Mongolian and European invasions, mm. could force a disclosure, is known as the Temple of Asgartha. Those who dwell there are possessed of great powers and have knowledge of all the world's affairs. The third possible independent mention of Agartha may actually predate Jacques Oliot. In 1871, the French philosopher and theologian Ernest Renan described Asgard, the city of the gods in Norse mythology, as being located in Central Asia. This is not a confirmed reference, but it is definitely strange to read of a utopian land 
so phonetically and geographically close to that which Jacques Collioux described just two years later. These three writings of Hargy, Jacques Collioux, and Renon in tandem are evidence that Agartha itself is not just a Western fantasy, but possibly a myth that goes much further back in the East. And while the oldest myth in this video may very well be that of the island, our next stop comes in second, the legendary hidden city of Shambhala. Shibola. Shibola, Shibola. Shambhala, go. For millennia, belief in this inner earth utopia was at the core of nearly every Tibetan tradition, and references to it can be found in various ancient texts, such as the Hindu Vishnu Purana, where Shambhala is predicted to be the birthplace of Kalki, the prophesied 10th avatar of the god Vishnu. But it's most notably detailed in the Tibetan Kala Chakra, the ancient and foundational Buddhist text, which was allegedly taken from Shambhala itself. Still, the magnitude of this kingdom's influence only begins to make itself known when we consider that it actually predates the Tibetan Buddhist religion and is confirmed to go as far back as the extinct Shangshung culture, as well as referred to in the Bon scriptures by the moniker Tagzig Olmo Lungring. On that note, Shambhala is famously known as the land of a thousand names. It has been called the Forbidden Land, the land of white waters, radiant spirits, and living fire, and the land of the living gods. The Chinese called it the Western Paradise of Shi Wang Mu. To the old believers of Russia, it is known as the Kingdom of Opona. Hindus called it Aryavartha, the land of the worthy ones. And perhaps it is one and the same as Saint Yev's Agartha. According to Saint Yev, the name Agartha means inaccessible to violence in Vitanian. Shambhala is a Sanskrit word meaning place of peace. This is but the first parallel between the two. The lines of distinction blur as we learn that Shambhala is said to be deep within the earth itself, a green valley with a beautiful city where extraordinary people live, isolated from the outside world by their own choosing and ruled by a benevolent and powerful king. It's a place where love and wisdom reign and where people are immune to suffering, want, and old age. More so, Shambhala is always spoken of as a place which really exists. The hidden kingdom is supposed to be situated in the mountainous regions of Eurasia, typically thought of as a vast complex of inhabited caverns underneath the Himalayas. Some legends say that the entrance to Shambhala is obscured within some abandoned monastery in a remote valley. It may or may not be important to note that several writers throughout the years have stated that the word Agartha appears in the 1774 scripture on Shambhala, written by the 6th Panchen Lama. Unfortunately, this is difficult for me to verify due to the obscurity of the text. Perhaps the most significant popularizer of the myth of Shambhala in the West was the controversial Russian occultist and philosopher, Helena Blavatsky, who studied in Tibet under the tutelage of Buddhist lamas from 1868 until late 1870, and eventually traveled through Asia in search of information about Shambhala, and particularly its connection to the legend of the island north of the Himalayas. In notes and journals published after her death, we find that Blavatsky had investigated a collection of old books preserved in the Chinese province of modern-day Fujian, which she describes as the chief headquarters of the Chinese aboriginals. There, many ancient texts regard the region of Tibet as the great seat of occult learning in the archaic ages, inhabited by teachers of light, sons of wisdom, and brothers of the sun. 
these terms referring to those versed in the esoteric doctrine taught by the residents of the sacred island. Blavatsky writes quite vividly as follows. With respect to the traditions concerning this island, and apart from the historical records of it preserved in the Chinese and Tibetan sacred books, the legend is alive to this day among the people of Tibet. The fair island is no more, but the country where it once bloomed remains here still, and the spot is well known to some of the great teachers of the snowy mountains, however much convulsed and changed his topography may have been by the awful cataclysm. According to the general belief, it is situated in the northwest of Tibet. Some place it within the unexplored central regions, inaccessible even to fearless nomadic tribes. Others hem it in between the range of the Gangdise Mountains and the northern edge of the Gobi Desert, south and north, and the more populated regions of Kunduz and Kashmir, of Gya Feling, British India, and China, west and east, which affords to the curious mind a pretty large latitude to locate it in. Others still place it between Namur Nur and the Kunlun Mountains, but one and all firmly believe in Shambhala and speak of it as a fertile, fairy-like land, once an island, now an oasis of incomparable beauty. Where's China? The place of meeting of the inheritors of the esoteric wisdom of the godlike inhabitants of the legendary island. And such an oasis is purported to remain underground. Thus, many have searched, but never has it been found. The painter and archaeologist Nicholas Rorick famously made a 15,000 mile, five year trek that cost the lives of five of his men in search of Shambhala. In his travel diary, Rorick wrote that the closest they had gotten to the hidden kingdom was in the Altai Mountains in the Valley of Uman, when an old sage led them to a small abandoned temple and revealed the entrance to a tunnel blockaded by carefully cut stones. He assured them that Shambhala would reveal itself when the world was ready. Until that day, humanity may only speculate with grandiose legends of what could be. Going full circle, from all my research, I can deduce a few things, which I encourage you to debate in the comments. First, that Agartha is likely another name for Shambhala, and Shambhala itself is a direct reference to the legend of the island. Second, based upon millennia of belief and centuries of testimony, as well as the presence of extensive and unexplored caverns in the region. If Agartha really exists, it's likely located beneath the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. Many hydrological tests carried out by splunking expeditions suggest the existence of large-scale caves below the surface, but so far the vast majority have remained inaccessible and we know that this mountain range was once the bed of an ocean floor. Third, that it is genuinely very strange that in every continent of our planet, we find a multitude of legends telling of deep tunnels that lead to a hidden underground godlike civilization. And with that, it's now time to travel the world and investigate a few of my and, you know, dodge the hijack, all this ball, earth stuff, images, right? I mean, we could say it a million times, you're not on a spinning ball, but because, you know, they keep feeding you images, you know, it feeds to your subconscious. So I, I got to wakey, wakey out the tardy ma, my knock and lie. No. When they talk hollow earth, it's only because they're thinking about a ball and they're saying, oh, there's a kingdom inside the ball. No, my knock, you're on a, you're on a plane, right? A plane of existence. So in an infinite plane, you got infinite caverns, man, infinite tree roots. Again, these caverns are what's left of the, you know, uh, silicon trees, man, the giant trees, right? So these giant trees got giant cavernous roots, my knock, <laughs> that lead, you know, to other, you know, uh, high power areas, man. You know what I'm saying? 
not necessarily just some devilish hell or something like that in Christianity. Yeah, you could have some definitely, you know, hazardous places, you know what I'm saying, some craziness, um, you know, but it's not about it's all being some spooky situation, you know. If if we call Mother Earth Mother Earth, then, you know, where's our heart bone, you know what I'm saying, inside, you know, everything's inside, so we can't, uh, you know, have some preconceived notion about inside being hell, you know, it, underground, underworld, you know, all that stuff. We got to, you know, reverse the curse and at least uh, listen. So now we can put the hollow earth, you know, together with what makes sense to begin with, that there's layers to the earth plane, you know, and that there's more worlds beyond the pole. And how can some of these vortex you, for, vortexes connect us to other worlds beyond the pole, to other earth ponds, you know what I'm saying? Not just to navigate our earth plane, but how can it help us navigate throughout the entire, you know, or other worlds outside of Antarctica, past the ice, right? You might not have to take that route that they got blocked up, you know what I'm saying, uh, with the Antarctic Treaty. You might be able to catch a vortex in Arizona, ping pow, you know what I'm saying? You might be able to catch a vortex in Peru, you know, all that, man. So, you know, we're just surfing the wave and join a victory lap drop nation, man. What'd it do? My personal favorites, all of which are true mysteries in of themselves. Uh, that's the hijack, man. Sometimes guys just hijack city. You know, they got to get paid. They got to get paid, man. I ain't mad at nobody, man. So how y'all really, man? Gives us a good chance to catch up. Y'all, y'all digging this, man? Can y'all feel us popping off? Okay, cool, man. We back, we back. All right, perfect. So when we talk tunnels, again, we're talking ancient giant tree roots. Mount Roraima cutoff tree, that cutoff tree stump is rooted, huh? So what's the what's the caverns like, right? What's the root system popping off in Mount Roraima? And this is letting you know why they got so much water coming up some of these trees, right? Because they have tree roots connected to the waters beneath Monaga. Primary man, Yosef, take the wheel. We return back to the cave of the patriarchs, the supposed gateway to the inner earth realm of the Garden of Eden. Okay. In this cave, many artifacts have been recovered that are thousands of years old, though no one has been able to venture deeper than the first few chambers. Like the Egyptian pyramids, it's thought that there are many hidden chambers and passageways that are yet to be discovered. The chambers that are currently known were found by removing boulders and blockages. And one room was revealed by removing a specific square stone that was marked differently than others near it. Because of the Cave of the Patriarch's religious significance, access to the caves themselves are almost always barred, even to archaeologists. And it's only been during times of political turmoil, such as for a brief period after the Six Day War, that we've been able to explore and gather artifacts from the caves. There are only two known entrances, and both are sealed. One by a metal grate, which is then covered by a dome, and the other is blocked by a large stone. We really have no idea how deep this cave goes. Mm. In Mayan mythology, there is an underground realm known as Shibalba, the land that the sun goes down into, mm. which is inhabited by godlike people, their civilization supposedly vanishing before recorded history. The Maya's sacred narrative, the Popol Vuh, describes actual structures and locations said to be part of Shibalba and places its entrance in Guatemala. Today in Guatemala, an astonishing 500 miles of tunnels have been mapped underneath the Mayan pyramid complex known as Tikal. There remains a mystery of how half a million Mayans escaped the decimation of their culture. And modern researchers believe the key lies in these tunnels. I mean, it makes sense. They're getting rolled up on by the invader. 
they got an exit plan. Like, nah, ain't gonna be these boats. We're gonna have to take the tunnels, right? Back to the Harriet Tubman flow, you know, Underground Railroad, right? So, okay. Again, like, are these ancient sites just markers, really? You know, yeah, they got civilization above, but really they're just, you know, communities, you know, in transport to the other areas, you know what I'm saying? Man, I mean, the truth sounds stranger than fiction, man, when it comes to the Earth plane. In Mexico, 11 subterranean stone temples and an ancient underground road have been found. And in May of 2020, archaeologists discovered a secret tunnel 10 meters underneath the Pyramid of the Moon in Teotihuacan using subsurface imaging technology. No one has been able to enter the tunnel yet or even find an entrance, and its true extent and purpose remain unknown. In Egypt, ancient historians made a number of references to a network of passages connecting the major pyramids, the Sphinx, and other underground locations. In particular, a colossal underground city of 3,000 chambers, lavishly decorated, known in Egyptian legends as the City of the Gods. In the 5th century BC, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote the following. There I saw 12 palaces regularly disposed, which had communication with each other, interspersed with terraces and arranged around 12 halls. It is hard to believe that they are the work of man. The walls are covered with carved figures, and each court is exquisitely built of white marble and surrounded by a colonnade. Near the corner where the labyrinth ends, there is a pyramid 240 feet in height, with great carved figures of animals on it, and an underground passage by which it can be entered. I was told, very credibly, that underground chambers and passages connected this pyramid with the pyramids at Memphis. This claim was backed up 500 years later with a matching account from the Greek historian Strabo. Yet, this city of the gods remains unfound. It's a fact that the Giza Plateau has an enormous underground system that is a combination of man-made tunnels, natural caverns, and subterranean rivers, which have been continuously discovered and mapped since 1978. And in ancient times, Giza was known as Rostal, which literally translates to Mouth of the Passages, a direct reference to the entrance of the Egyptian mythological underworld. Certainly, this is a strange one, but perhaps not as a Garthian as the next. Early Indian religions, particularly Jainism, Hinduism, and Buddhism, believed in an underground world known as Patala, which translates literally to that which is below the feet. This realm is described as being filled with splendid jewels, beautiful forests and lakes, and lovely maidens. Sweet fragrances and music filled the air, and the ground which one walks upon is often coated in gold. Like Shambhala, Patala is believed to be a real place, a civilization comprised of realms and cities. In the surf- Now, we don't got it up right now, but we're gonna get back on the maps with the uh, worlds beyond the poles and all that, man, because remember um, that map and outside, it had all these, you know, had all these uh, islands and all these areas beyond the poles. And one of them is Patala. Remember the one we had, it had uh, the Eye of Horus, <laughs> it had all this stuff on there, right? All these islands, everything mapped out. It had Thought the Moving Island, remember that one? It's the same map that got Thought the Moving Island and it had Patala. And it's just a world beyond the pole. So what's the correlation between the inner earth worlds and the worlds beyond the pole? Is it one thing? Are the worlds the same or inside actually, you know, are these vortexes to get to these worlds beyond the pole? I mean, that's an interesting, you know, way to look at. Surface world, caves guarded by spiritual beings known as asuras, 
are believed to be entrances to Patala. Perhaps most interestingly, the inhabitants of Patala are the Naga, a oh. race of semi-divine, half-human, half-serpent beings that can occasionally take human form. Rituals devoted to the Naga have occurred throughout South Asia for at least 2,000 years. They are most often described as wealthy, powerful, and proud beings, strongly associated with water, rivers, lakes, and seas. <laughs> and notice all the artist depictions always got same thing, you know, snake, you know, reptile versus this. You know what I mean? When we talk about Naga, first of all, we put it in Hebrew, Naga, Na as that noon flow. You know what I mean? You got the Ga like the Ga, you know, like that that movement, or you got the Ga like that secret letter, that twenty third letter in Hebrew, like the twisted, like the dragon. So you see a bunch of snakes, think dragon, not snake. And when they say half this and half that, yeah, you know, they might be still in the frequency with with their version of some type of uh, demi something, you know what I'm saying? We're connecting with that energy, frequency, and vibration that is within a certain seed of real net goose, real kings, real queens that have that fire, that water, Managi, got that ether in them, you know, that's that dragon. And that dragon is within us, you know what I'm saying? That's that ether wave, Managi, that's that fire. So, you know, dodge all the hijacking, all of their, you know, Hindu Hindu situation. You are an Indian superior. So you're coming before their myth, you know what I'm saying? Putting their mythology on things and putting their their images on things and all these all these arms and all these blues. Managi, you are the dragon. But the dragon is connected, you know what I'm saying, with the original elements of creation, Managi. So all these things are one thing. Ama. Mother Earth, Earth is a dragon, my you know what I'm saying? You're talking about the ancient ones, you know? So when you're tapped in that frequency, hey, that's my Naga, you know what I'm saying? And that's that frequency that we all, you know, spark up with, you know, that we all spiral up with, you know what I'm saying? My Negus, nigga, nigger, right? Negus, Naga, NG. and intangible. Just like they say dragons are guarding treasures. You see what I'm saying? All right, let's go. Beyond India, you will find a strong belief in the Naga in countries. And again, they're in what, little India. We gotta pull the maps up again of India. India superior, right? So little India and their mythologies ain't got nothing on what's happening right here in America. And this is what they're calling the East such as Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Thailand, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Man. Every one of these cultures associates the Naga with a race of snake-like demigods who live underground, some going as far as to assert that the Naga are the origins of their people. We may even be able to argue that the ancient Chinese legends of dragons are references to the Naga. As a <laughs> Dang, so you're going to choose a dragon or snake? Because we can, we can pull it up again with the alchemy drop, you know. There's a difference between the alchemical dragon or an al in alchemy there's a dragon and in alchemy there's a snake. Alchemy, you're talking about the breakdown of the energy, the flow, right? So, you know, if there's an alchemical dragon and an alchemical serpent or snake, then it lets you know that there's two separate frequencies in alchemy with dragons and snakes. Now you have the Mu and Atlantis war, and you have a big difference in the frequency of those that are pretending to be Nagas in their snake frequency <laughs> and those that are actually dragons, you know what I'm saying? That's two different things. So all these cultures are, you know, biting off of the wave of the original dragon flow. 
which he just mentioned right here, that's carried out in China. And again, where's China? As they look suspiciously similar and are said to be wise and powerful creatures, the mentors of kings and the creators of kingdoms. Mm. According to Chinese mythology, most dragons live in the sky, but there are actually two races of dragons that are earthbound. The Fu Zanlong, which are underworld dragons who guard treasures, and the Di Long, which are earth dragons who live underground and control the flow of water. And notice it keeps saying long or long, right? Long like your breath, like your <gasps> wow, dragon fire, your breath, right? So it's all about that breath. Two associations that exactly parallel the Naga. Because of this, we may hypothesize that these two beings stem from the same mythological root. And perhaps more profoundly, I think that there is a fundamental connection between Shambhala and the inner earth world of the Naga, Patala, and Agartha by association, which I haven't found discussed anywhere else. Watch out for them. Watch out for them dog heads. I see some dog headed people. And clearly, you know what I'm saying, before they're paint, you could tell they painted over these images over and over again. But clearly, you see uh, copper colored nagas, you know what I'm saying? You feel me? <laughs> Let's go. During my extensive research into the subject, from the most simple standpoint, both are described as immensely beautiful civilizations which are located underground. In addition, they're inhabited by a spiritually, intellectually, and physically advanced race of beings who are guardians of treasure of many kinds, one of those being lost knowledge. Of course, both are supposedly located around the same geographic region with access points said to be found in the caves of the Himalayan mountains. The legends for both realms, of course, are more ancient than written history can account for, and their mythology seems to seep into the canon of both Hinduism and Buddhism, Patala primarily being a Hindu concept and Shambhala being Buddhist. It's also fascinating to note that Saint Yev, as I mentioned earlier, was fond of the detail that the people of Agartha have two tongues with which they can speak two languages simultaneously. When we consider the tongue of a snake, the Naga might actually be. <laughs> so here we go again. Are we talking forked tongue languages or the ability to speak two languages at once? Or you think these Nagas are literally walking around with two Tongues, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Come on, man. Uh oh, we got some hijack coming. Agarthians. All right, man. We almost paid this out a few more minutes. You know what I'm saying? We're going to let them pay their bills, give them a couple of seconds, my nugget. Bang. Back. We back. We return to the time of those fateful lessons in Sanskrit, as there is one last mystery yet to ponder. What I speak of is a twist in the story. The mysterious so-called second Indian mm. of the great Agarthian school that made contact with Alexandre Sontiev. In 1935, Jean Rayon, an influential French esoteric scholar and close associate of René Guénon, asserted that a restrictive sect of Hindus had been searching for a suitable student of Western origin to imbue long-forgotten doctrines, and had specifically chosen saint Yev as their ideal vessel. They sent the Afghan, Prince Harji Sharif, to transfer this knowledge. Rayon then expanded the details in 1948, writing the following. Later, at a date which we cannot specify precisely, Sontiev was in contact with a Hindu, far more serious than Harji Sharif, who 
were originated from North India. The evidence for this second Indian is corroborated in the analytic index. This is unquestionably the more serious guru Jean Rayon wrote of. This specific notebook connects the 22 letters of the Vatanian alphabet with Hebrew and Sanskrit root words. Uh oh. Apparently, at some point, the project did not go as planned, and the second Indian determined Saint Yev to be unworthy. He and Harji halted their teachings and left saint yev with an incomplete understanding of the doctrines of which he dedicated the rest of his life to figuring out as seen in the obsessive speculative nature of his final work the archaeometer but in the first place why was saint yev chosen as an ideal vessel to introduce the ideas of agartha to the west this is a question that has long been speculated the leading theory is his breakthrough work, Mission of the Jews. Mm. In the preface to the book, saint Yev wrote extensively on a certain letter written by, in his words, one of the affiliates of the great fraternity of the Himalayas. He then translates the letter into French, calling it a pure Orient Pearl. Orient. The contents of this letter deal largely with India, science, mysticism, and cycles. In fact, this letter was one of the now famous Mahatma letters, written by the Mahatmas Kuthumi and Maurya. If we turn back the clock five years, the occultist Helena Blavatsky, who we briefly discussed before, moved to India, where she met the Tibetan Mahatmas Kuthumi and Maurya. They asked a favor of her. The two teachers wanted to perform a seven-year experiment to see if the West would be receptive of the wisdom the East had to offer. They chose two of Blavatsky's associates as initiates, the ornithologist Alan Tavian Hume and the Anglo-Indian newspaper editor Alfred Percy Sinnott. The letters they wrote to them would become known as the Mahatma letters. Hume did not stick around for long, but Sinet did. Sinet was particularly valuable to the Mahatmas as his job and connections as a prominent newspaper editor allowed him to publicize their philosophy. However, over time, the Mahatmas became disillusioned with how Sinet's Western prejudices misconstrued their doctrines and their correspondence with him ultimately ceased. This same story may be told for saint Yev, as he was likely chosen for his public display of sympathy toward Oriental doctrines and his career as a writer and publicist were on the rise. Thus, it's unlikely to be pure luck that in 1885, a mutual connection introduced him to Prince Harji Sharif, who then encouraged him to learn Sanskrit, study the Bhagavad Gita, and eventually discover the secrets of the Vatanian alphabet and Agartha, seemingly on his own. Unfortunately, from the evidence we have available, it seems saint Yev became a little too enthusiastic and carried away with the concepts. Similar to the newspaper editor, Alfred Sinna, Alexandre saint Yev was ultimately chained to his prejudices. Although he had the utmost respect for the East, saint Yev would write in his book, Mission of India, that the world of Agartha will be accessible for all mankind when Christianity lives up to the commandments which were once drafted by Moses and God. KTC. And in his final work, The Archaeometer, he stated that he would eventually be necessary. Yeah, we got to dig on his archaeometer, man, because you see different 
alphabets, you know what I'm saying? You see the Hebrew alphabet, I see the sheen. You know what I mean? You see different towels around here, man. You got what they call vol Volcanian or something like that. But the Sanskrit, I mean, language is frequency, man. And apparently they needed that Hebrew to tap into something, right? Archaeometer? <laughs> Might be a good little drop. We got uh, about three minutes and some change. Let's get it. Let's get it, man, for the dismount necessary for india to be converted to a christian and catholic order uh oh uh oh jean rayon stated the problem most clearly it seems that westerners even when they manifest traditional tendencies do not resign themselves to not being superior to the rest of the world one can believe that such an attitude contributed not a little to the preventing saint yev from profiting fully from the oriental teachings which he had occasion to receive it may forever be a mystery what revelations were withheld but it's finally time to follow in the footsteps of the french occultist more than a century later and draw whatever conclusions are possible in this truly mind-bending puzzle that is agartha I mean, dig on this, right? Dig on this. So when they over there with the Coronado expedition looking for the seven cities of gold, and they over there with Espanico looking for seven cities of gold, and they're digging on Cibola or Shimbala, but all they see is a little whatever on the surface. They can't really, it ain't nothing over here. They're writing back, ain't nothing over here. <laughs> all right, so to our far left we see what a little brazil flow like it's some type of it this kind of looks like you know in a different perspective the same type of a you know earth plane and as a muzzle equidestant ae projection with the with them gateways going in and out of the firmament right the outside still looks like it could be a uh Antarctica situation to the right, you see King Solomon's Mines, Pyramid of One of the more one of the more interesting maps I have to say. I have to say. The great Agarthian school, of which Harji and the second Indian hailed from, was likely an obscure and restricted group, which I've come to refer to as the cult of Agartha. We can deduce that they indeed existed but only arose to Western knowledge on two occasions, that of Louis Jacolio and saint -Yeb. As for the strange Vatanian alphabet and language, this was clearly quite developed and not rudimentary, but still tied to secretive initiation practices. Now for the big question, as to whether an inner earth kingdom such as Agartha, Shambhala, or Patala actually exists, or perhaps the island that once sat in the ocean of the Gobi or Taklamakan desert. There is no hard evidence, only a strange collection of legends that really make you wonder. And considering that both deserts, as well as the Himalayan mountains, are some of the most extreme and uncharted places on Earth, there is no doubt that much is left below our feet to discover. So now I turn the discussion to you. Is there any significance to the connected myths across the globe? Can certain tunnels and caves truly lead you to a different world? And does the East really hold secrets that are beyond Western comprehension? Let your theories be known in the comments below maybe we can solve these mysteries as for now 
Thank you all so much for watching. If you KTC, we keep the call. Hey, shout out. See how how many, you know what I'm saying, you know, real tribe, real knockers, you know what I'm saying, we can really affect and uh what else we can do when we, you know, truly tribe up, truly team up, man. And you know that with the numbers, you know, a little bit goes a long way. Uh um, again, AI Robert Scott, Tracy Slocum, fifty dollars goes a long way <laughs> with five hundred code keeping knockers, my knockers. Fifty dollars, my knockers goes a long way with five hundred code keeping knockers. You get to 25K very, very fast. When you got 500 code keeping nuggets, 1,000 code keeping nuggets, we out of here. You know what I'm saying? Allow Wa, uh, keep the water flowing. Shout out Aqua D, felt good putting a bag in my Aqua's hands from the tribe, man, from Drop Nation. Allow Wa, uh, let's keep it flowing for the code keepers. <laughs> KTC, keep the code. KTC, keep the code. I knock. KTC, keep the code, man. One more time for the outro, man. Can you get it? Can you dig it? Tribal Mafia. Uh. 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 Let go. To your feet, we be dripping gold. Dripping gold. KTC, that means keep the code. Keep the code. KFC, we do that no more. No more. Cherokee, like the days of old. Days of old. Vaccinate, we just tell them no. Tell them no. We the copper car original. original. Press the job, he been here before. Before. say a three, we already know. Uh, Grand Canyon, they be hiding acres. <laughs> Killing purple like my favorite Laker. <laughs> KTC, that mean keep the code. Rest in peace, Kobe, he the go. Mama with the wings, that's a dragon. That's a trap. Used to bell up with my pants sagging. Now we can redefine it high fashion. Got that glow for whoever's asking. Chicken mago on your favorite corner. Need that work, we your favorite donor. Mip sauce to your front door. Make them holler, we don't want no more. Uh, Driving up is our only option. option. For the car, we go get it popping. KTC, that mean keep the code. Code, keep us here from head to toe. Uh, last chance is your friend to phone. Cause we hijack free, we'll sink your bone. Soon he comments rapping how we cool. That's the by Nico shook, these knockers shoot. Uh, KTC, you know how we do. Put our power first, we'll never lose. Purple tears and joy out of you. Purple crying cuz red us blue. And I put it on the AI. MHO E taking off. Yeah, we dripping in that man's song. We paid the cost, now we beat the ball. Travel music, we just let them know. KTC, that means keep the code. Tribal mafia, they going stupid. Getting smarter because the drop is blue. Fire started just to light it up. The coops they died trying to trap them up. Slip that treaty through the back door. He's and fresh and made it more and more. Grab my shield, wouldn't hesitate. While they argue heritage or hate. USA, call it Hijack City. PSA, you ain't fucking with me. OT Naga from the day of old. KTC, that mean keep the code. Swan Knight, I'm a bravo. That was back in 774. We're bitten histories, we got the book. MHO, E, we got the look. Bye bye, smile, drinking hot water. Now we can all say hello, Bob. KTC, that mean keep the code. Keep the code. Enjoy Shabbat, chillin' in my row. In my row. That's Clan Ross at your front. Uh -huh. 
you gonna play your way and ask that go. Bought this summer for the free throw. Nipsey hustle, let the wings grow. He gon' hit us with that free throw. He can quit y'all in that green low. Hit the switches for the free show. Carpet chickens in the street, bro. Both three, two, we the free show. KTC, let me keep the code. KTC, let me keep the code. KTC, keep the code. KTC, keep the code. KTC, keep the code. Hey, shout to the. 500 code, keep it nuggets, man. Keep the code, man. Keep that towel on you, man. Hey, Irvin Reed said it best, man. KTC, M-H-O-E, D-Y-O-D-H. And when you take a stand to hijack, they can get the drop off, yo, man. Swan Knight, Templar up, man. Hey, man, everyone got that tribal music slapping, man. Y'all keep it going. Y'all keep the code. Vibe everybody up in real time, man. Dracon, man, it says flames, 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 real tribal mafia music. Charles Johnson, man, peace, indigenous Amaru Khans of the Turtle Island, man. Prince Eclipse says 432, y'all own, y'all own all my playlists. Hey, keep these hits coming. About time, some brothers with talent and something for real to say. Get out there, hey, ha, a lot why. Steven Torres, another one. Con, con. The cold blue, purple, red. Give us that Bruce Leroy glow popping off with my noggins and swan nights. I love why. You see what's happening, man. It's all happening, man. I appreciate y'all for real. Miss D, shout out. Fireball, Aqua. Hey, keep the, hey, the, keep the cold, KTC. <laughs> Love to Miss D. Yo, Valim said, 432, what name you thinking of on your Cedar staff, fam? Yeah, uh, okay, okay, man. Um, You need a name, man. You need a name, man. Hey, just call me Drop, man. <laughs> just call me Drop. Shout out, man. I appreciate it, man. Uh, hey, where's my staff, man? That, that'll be amazing, man. Hey, uh, hey KTCMHOE, man. Five Eyes Ma, we popping off, man. Halawa, Janice Fitzgerald. Mac Matt said, yeah, no, KTC, no deal, no code, no deal. You ain't, you ain't keeping the code. Hey, man, no deal. A lot of why. LaRock, man, he says, salute. Royalty, M-H-O-E, a while, yo, Raleem, a high, Chauncey Brown, Khan, code keeper, man, what it do? He, he's code keeper number 499, man, what it do, bro? Hey, <laughs> sheesh, hey, man, hey, it's all happening. Keep the code, you already know. Do it like you've been here before. Hey, we're gonna get that remix. Matter of fact, we already got Ma kicking the remix. So look out for the remix with Five Eyes Ma, man. Hey, it's all happening. And hey, we got a Tribal Mafia remix coming in hot. We got an MHOE remix, Tribal Mafia. We popping off. Hey, out to my real ones allowed. Why, man? To try. Y'all keep doing what you're doing, man. And uh, just know it's only the wave. Keep the code. You already know why.